Our next speaker uh, from this morning is Professor Ernesto Lupercio from um, the Center for Research and Advanced Studies in Mexico City. And he will um, give us the first part of his mini course on moduli in quantum toric geometry. Thank you. So this is a mini course. Uh, it is uh, uh, about this thing that we have been developing for a while. Ludmil Katsarkov, Laurent Merseman, and Alberto Verkhovsky. And we have been developing this theory of uh, the generalized toric geometry. Uh, it um, uh, given a toric variety, it deforms it into the non commutative realm. Uh, and once this happens, now uh, toric varieties as Equivalent toric objects are very rigid, but now you can do the modular space of toric varieties. And we have started to study these modular spaces and their compactifications, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll go very leisurely. It is a mini course. I, 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 I will try to go uh, slowly and uh, hopefully you, you'll ask many questions so that uh, I can clarify the, all the various issues. In any case, the, of what I will say today, not tomorrow, not, not the day, not the second part, is in this paper called Quantum non commutative Total Geometry Foundations. Uh, and here we introduce the modular space, but then we study the modular space elsewhere. Uh, so this is, uh, so today I will review this paper, Quantum non commutative Toric Geometry Foundations. So well, uh, uh, some of you uh, are very familiar with Toric manifolds. Toric manifolds, to and Toric manifolds are both real and complex. Uh, are the building blocks. Um, uh, in the classical theory, in the classical toric varieties, uh, a classical and complex dimensional compact project with Kähler toric manifold can be defined as an equivalent projective compactification of, of the n dimensional complex torus, C star cross C star cross C star, T, D to the C, D times. For C star is C uh, minus zero. And well, the classical theory of toric uh, manifolds have found multiple applications and uh, toric, differential geometry, etc. Uh, in the classical theory, both a real and complex toric play uh, an important role. Uh, the real torus inside the complex torus. And it acts holomorphically on the whole of X, that is the compactification of the complex torus. And thinking of uh, X as a Kähler manifold, uh, well, a Kähler as a symplectic manifold, the action is Hamiltonian. And so you have uh, the moment map for this Hamiltonian action goes into RD, that is the Lie algebra of the torus. Uh, and uh, uh, is a compact convex set by the theorem of Atija and Gilliam and Sternberg, but it's more in this case. Uh, it's, a, it's a polytope, and it is the, as a combinatorial object, is a, a dual of a triangulation of a sphere, simplicial case. And uh, all the slopes of all the edges of this polytope are rational inside RD, and this called a del Sant polytope. It has these two properties. There is a dual of a triangulation of the sphere, combinatorial property, and geometric property, the authentic property, all the slopes of all the edges are rational. So that's a del Sant polytope. And this is a, this is a, a for the students, or whoever is in the watching the recording or soon, for the students, uh, uh, I have this paper in the January 2021 notices of the AMS where I uh, 
go in much more detail about some of the basics of non-commutative geometry and the like. In any case, there is this picture there, and this is a typical situation. We have the image of the moment map is this pointer, and typically the inverse image of a point will be a, tor a real torus, and the real torus will be of the various dimensions uh, uh, corresponding to the dimension of the facet of the poly of the stratification of the uh, facets of the polytope. You get all this tori. In this case, at the edges you get circles, and at the vertices you get points that are tori. So you get all this tori in various dimensions for the classical moment map. And this is a classical picture. You get real tori. You have a complex torus acting on the whole thing. Equi uh, and it's an equivalent compactification. Uh, so uh, this is what I just said in words. Uh, now, uh, if you take this dual to this polytope, you get this fan. Uh, so the, the actual object, if you don't remember the metric, but only the complex structure, is the fan, and uh, not the polytope. The, uh, the, I could move this face a little bit up here to get a different polytope, but the same fan. And uh, the fan is like the equivalent class for these possible polytopes. And the choice of a polytope is like the choice of a point in the Kähler cone. So it's the choice of a point in the Kähler cone of this variety. Uh, so uh, it's more natural to think about the fan that is dual to the polytope than of the polytope itself. Uh, and this is what I say here. So what is the basic idea of quantum toric geometry? The basic idea in quantum toric geometry is, I you mentioned that there is all this tori here. Here, I mentioned many tori. Here you see this tori and the complex tori that acts on everything. And we are going to change these classical commutative Lie groups uh, for quantum tori. So every tori that appeared in the classical theory of quantum toric varieties was a tori. I will change it for a quantum torus. And then I will get quantum toric varieties. And then I will get quantum toric geometry. Uh, some people call this quantum tori non-commutative tori, depending on, on the reference. But there, the problem of using non-commutative tori is that they are the commutative groups in non-commutative non spaces. So they are non-commutative spaces, but commutative as groups. So uh, I prefer quantum tori to avoid that confusion. Yeah, and it's also standard terminology. Uh, just in the same manner in which toric manifolds can be thought as integral systems, all quantum toric manifolds can in turn be interpreted as quantum integrable systems, a factor of quantum integrable systems. And likewise, for the same essential reason that a version of mirror symmetry for toric varieties can be construed as a parametrized version of T duality for tori, and this already appeared on Bernardo's talk. Analogously, quantum toric manifolds will have a version of mirror symmetry in which the basic component is non is a non commutative version of T duality. Uh, uh, from a slightly different point of view. Quantum toric geometry can be thought of as a deformation with a deformation parameter h bar that will be very important in everything that follows, this deformation parameter of the whole field of toric geometry. Uh, and most, uh, many of the things that appear in these big, thick books on toric geometry can be uh, generalized to quantum toric geometry while very many results from classical theory have their counterparts in quantum generalization, the proof of such results are not entirely obvious. It's an interesting generalization. It's, it's not an entirely trivial generalization. And then on the other hand, the flavor of the theory is, uh, in any case, uh, uh, the flavor of the theory is familiar, and etc. And maybe we can minimize this. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and the classical theory is a particular case of the quantum theory. Uh, it would be a little bit perverse to stu study classical theory, uh, toric geometry this way, but you could do it. Uh, 
Now the basic, but now I have to go into the basic block. Of course, I have to tell you, I have to make you love the quantum torus. So uh, you already love the torus. Uh, if you like the torus, you like the quantum torus. Uh, so you have the torus. Now you have the quantum torus, and this one depends on the deformation parameter h bar. Uh, uh, and it's one of the most basic spaces in non commutative geometry. So, the real quantum two torus. Well, uh, if I think of uh, non commutative spaces as non commutative algebras of equivalence, equivalents, already mentioned in the previous talk, uh, well, you can think that as a non commutative algebra, the opposite, of course. Uh, as a non commutative algebra, the algebra of functions on the non commutative torus uh, has these two generators, uh, x and y, and they don't quite commute. That's the whole point. xy is yx e to the 2 pi i h bar. And for me, today will be important that h bar is real. I won't allow a complex deformation parameter, just a real deformation. Com and complexity will come magically, you see. It's interesting. So this h bar is real. And when the algebra can be realized as an operator algebra, appear in quantum mechanics. Uh, in actually, it does appear in this famous paper that won the Nobel Prize for Physics of Max Born, uh, Werner Heisenberg, both got the Nobel Prize, not Pascual Jordan, uh, but they, anyway, they are called these, these two papers from 1925-1926. So this algebra appears. And uh, when we specialize the parameter h to be 0, we want this quantum torus to become the ordinary torus. Uh, and um, uh, the way I'm writing this, in this paper, it appeared kind of in Lie algebra notation, the way it was Weil who wrote this equation for the first time in, in his uh, 1927 uh, uh, quantum mechanics and group theory. So it's there in Norman Bale, 1927, uh, and it's, uh, this non commutative algebra is important. But it's very important in physics. And uh, for a mathematician, there is this arithmetic condition that is less stressed in physics. That is, uh, when the parameter is uh, irrational, this space is truly non commutative. There is not a commutative variable that more it equivalent to this one. But when the parameter is rational, there is a commutative algebra that is more equal equivalent to this one, and so it's not a truly non-commutative space. It's secretly commutative. So uh, although the algebra is non-commutative per se, it's more equal equivalent to a commutative one. In any case, uh, Alan Cohn gave a beautiful geometric interpretation of this, uh, for this space. He said, this is space. I get, you have the algebra function, but you want to think of it as space, not as an algebra. How do you do it? Alan Cohn figured it out. Uh, he says, oh, this is the space of leaves of a foliation. That, uh, this is the space of leaves of a foliation. Uh, uh, the Kronecker foliation of a slope h bar on the torus, we'll see the picture in a second, uh, consists of taking the collision of Euclidean plane. Uh, you take the Euclidean plane, you take all the straight lines, all the lines of the slope h bar, and now you project this into the torus. And it gives a foliation in the, in the torus. And it's very clear that it's a dichotomy. If h bar, h bar is rational, you get a foliation by torus nodes. And every leaf is compact and not measure zero. Uh, and then it's nowhere. But if H is irrational, you get a foliation by uh, copies of R uh, inside the torus. No, but now every leaf is dense everywhere. And it, it feels more complicated when H bar is irrational. Uh, so, uh, and well, this is a very important map for us. This projection of the plane into the torus is extremely important to us. Is the exponential map, and it's the only analytic function that I need to define these objects. So they lived in this slight extension 
of algebraic geometry uh, called uh, all minimal uh, geometry or whatever. So it's no extension of algebraic geometry. I don't need many analytic functions. I just need one more. And so I have a, the lead space of the foliation. So this is the foliation. And the foliation has a transversal. I just take a, take a transversal circle once and for all. And it has a holonomy. If I start here, I go along a lead, I come back with an angle. And this angle is h bar. So the holonomy of the foliation is h bar. And completely determines the foliation, this holonomy. Completely determines the foliation, the holonomy, because it's a linear foliation. So it, uh, uh, h bar is the Planck's constant for the algebra in, in the book of 1927. But Alan Cohn observes that it can be interpreted as the holonomy of a foliation. And but what does this have to do with the algebra? What does this foliation, this holonomy, has to do with that, this non-commutative algebra? You may ask yourself. And uh, well, this is what I already said. There is this dichotomy. And uh, the thing is that if I divide by this group action, I see, see it as a flow, as an R action on the torus. If the slope is rational, the quotient is a circle, because the leaves are torus knots. But if the slope is irrational, the quotient is non hausdorff So uh, as a first approximation, we think of the leaf space of the chronic foliation as a quotient topological space. Uh, but this is non hausdorff uh, We would obtain the same quotient by considering only the transversal circle and the rotation by the angle h bar. And we, will, we do the quotient. We get the same. If h bar is rational, we get a circle by rational rotation is a circle of smaller radius, of course. But if h bar is irrational, then I get this dust, this non, this non house of space. Uh, 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 when h is irrational, uh, we get this non house of space. So we have this topological space, but then it's a non house of topological space. You can do a little bit better if you consider them as, as stacks. Uh, 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 we, uh, and that's what we will do. Uh, there's two fertile ways to enrich this topological space that is non hausdorff uh, One is by using non commutative algebra. So uh, I can think of this as a, this group action, I can think of it as a Lie groupoid. And this Lie groupoid has a C star algebra associated with convolution algebra. And this sister algebra can be, because it's a very reasonable sister algebra, can be represented as an algebra of operators, an operator algebra. And this operator algebra is exactly the algebra that appears in uh, in Weiss 1927, uh, quantum mechanics and group theory, exactly that algebra. Uh, so uh, so the, uh, the natural algebra functions on the space of leaves of the foliation for this foliation is the algebra that appears in Weiss' book. Uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, so this can be thought as a geometrization, as a non commutative space, uh, as, a, as a stack that geometrizes this non commutative space, this non commutative algebra. So, uh, uh, so well, you can think of it uh, just going on directly to the algebra, to the convolution algebra of the group point, or take the group point. Take its equivalence relation in an appropriate sense, call also Morita equivalence, sorry for the confusion, and uh, get the stack. It will be a non separated stack, but worry not, everything will be fine. It, it, it's, uh, it, it, it will still live in this old minimal world. In any case, the stack for the quantum torus, well, you get this group, the group point of the action, you get by the convolution con functor, you get a non commutative sister algebra. Group points also go to stack by, by taking those equivalence, seeing them as atlases for stacks. And the convolution con functor, it, it sends Morita classes to Morita classes, so it sends stacks to non commutative space. So from the stack, you can co obtain a non commutative space, uh, but, but you can enrich the non commutative space to stack. And you can call the, and you can consider the non-commutative torus, the quantum torus, in any of these four categories. Uh, 
Uh, so we already saw what it is here in non-commutative algebra and in non-commutative spaces. But, uh, but, we, but we will enrich it into a stack or group point. Uh, and uh, well, we have here, exactly, this is algebra that appeared in Weil's book. Then this is uh, the Morita Kuhn's class of this algebra. But we have the stack that we will call the quantum torus. I will call this the non-commutative torus, and I will call this the quantum torus. The stack, I will call the quantum torus. So the dramatic persona are the translation lead group points by this group action of the reals by a slope h bar, the non-commutative algebra that is a convolution algebra of the lead group points, up to Fourier transform, up to Fourier transform, the non-commutative space uh, uh, is a Morita Kuhn's class of the algebra, and the stack obtained by stackification of the translation group point will be the, non the quantum torus. The stack obtained by stackification of the group action by slope h bar on the torus. And this is a two-dimensional one. So these are my avatars for the quantum torus, and I will, will, I will be working all the time with the stack. But the stack over what side? I'll tell you in a minute. I know you were going to ask that. In any case, uh, 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 so we have, well, it's the same to take the transversal as it is to take the whole torus and the foliation. It's the same to take the translation, the transversal and the rotation. And again, we have the exponential map that takes, uh, ah, but we can take the universal cover of the new algebra of S1, R, and now we are, we are acting by an abelian subgroup of R uh, that is generated by one and H bar. It has two generators, one and H bar, and it acts on R, and it's, this is what is in crystallography is called a quasi-lattice, but I will call it a quantum lattice or a Q-lattice. So this is a quasi-lattice, a quantum lattice inside of R. Uh, there is this more traditional lattice, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, integral lattice. This is uh, uh, over Z is of rank two inside of R. It's, for example, when H is irrational. For example, H, think of square root of two. When H is irrational, this is a, a higher rank lattice inside of R acting, and the quotient is a quantum torus. So if I take R, I take this quantum lattice, it's more or less the same to have the quantum lattice as it is to have the quantum torus, uh, given by the holonomy of the foliation and just the lattice that generates the torus. So this is important for us. This is the exponential isomorphism, and I only use exponential function. Okay, so uh, gamma is a quasi-lattice, but I will call it a quantum lattice. And gamma behaves quite differently whether H is rational or not. In the former case, gamma is really a lattice in R, uh, and it's always isomorphic to Z, uh, but the interesting case is when it's not, you know, and this is kind of the Lie algebra of the rotation group. In any case, uh, we have the logarithmic representation of the quantum torus is R modulo a quantum lattice. Yeah, I'll go back to that because that H bar will be the parameter for the modular space of toric varieties, and it's an arithmetic uh, group that is acting on the lattices that gives you the equivalent relation. It's an arithmetic group that is acting on the lattice. So, uh, uh, well, just very quickly, I will, but I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that more explicitly. Uh, uh, just very quickly, T2, uh, I, com I can complexify the story. I can just answer with it. Uh, because my lattices are real, uh, totally real, uh, I can just complexify the answer with it. Not a problem. So I just complexify. This is the first variation. The second variation is that I can take these Kronecker foliations in higher dimensional tori of various subdimensions, of, of, uh, of varying the codimension. So I could have these planes, linear foliations of the higher 
higher dimensional toroid, right? but it could be have the upset of various co dimensions uh, depending on, uh, and then I would have various generators on gamma. Uh, it would be, uh, this will always be a finite rank abelian group of, of the set. Uh, uh, it will be a set N inside of Rn. I said M inside of Rn, but M could be much larger than M, the, the dimension of the vector space. Just like in R, I could take as many algebraically independent generators as I want for gamma. And then I would have this, uh, this qu quantum lattice acting on, on R or on C. And just a finely generated additive group of some RD. Uh, so, and we think always of them as a holonomy of a, you can always think of them as a holonomy of a foliation in a one, in a higher dimensional toy. Uh, so it uh, can get very confusing. Uh, that's why you have C here, CV. This is a transversal circle, universal cover complexified. This is a complexification of the universal cover of the transversal circle, CD. And this way, this is called TD plus one because the foliation lives in a TD plus one dimensional torus. The foliation lives in TD plus one. So it's super easy to get confused. Uh, so the simple example of a quantum torus variety is a quantum predictive line. It's just, uh, just like CP1. You see star and then you put zero, and you put infinity, you compactify and you get CP1. To get CP1 quantum, you take one of these quantum toy and you compactify and you pray that everything is okay. And it will be okay. Uh, but you can produce quantum P1 also with two charts. Uh, but now you have a whole, whole modular of P1s, not only CP1, but all modular of P1s. All the weighted projective lines will appear there. But then there will be the irrational ones that are not all the things, are not, are bona fide, non commutative spaces. So, uh, well, I could do it more, a little bit more explicitly, taking Z here, and Z minus one here, and this is stacky chart, and this is stacky chart, and I, get, I glue these two stacky charts. Uh, and, it, and it gives me, the comp a compactification for this quantum torus. Uh, and well, we would kind of want to think that pi one of this is kind of gamma, for so it's high rank. And uh, it would have the wrong dimension. Uh, so we'll have to look at the same phenomena that Bernardo was looking at in his previous talk. We'll have to look at Jerv to clarify this confusion. I'll explain. So, the naive dimension of T2RH seems to be 2 minus 1 equals 1, uh, because the dimension of the group that is acting is 1. Uh, this seems to be the naive dimension. The problem is this thing is contractible when, when H bar is irrational. And I will insist to make it contractible when H bar is rational, rather than thinking of it as a torus knot. I think of it as the real line winding infinitely many times about the torus knot. I think of it as the real line winding infinitely many times around the torus knot. And so uh, I require a set stabilizer. The homotopy type of this is given by the homotopy quotient, but this thing is contractible. So it has homotopic dimension too. And the same holds for this. And this, this reflects in the periodic cyclic homology of the algebra. Uh, and it looks like a two-dimensional space. It does look like a, a, the periodic cyclic homology. So, uh, uh, well, there's a compactification of this. Look at the one and the two. <laughs> uh, and indeed, we have a complex dimension one and a homotopic dimension of two. In fact, we will describe a manifold that is compact complex, but not symplectic. The, this manifold is compact complex, not Kähler, not symplectic, together with a holomorphic foliation in on the manifolds. So just like the torus, I can think 
that the quantum torus comes from a holomorphic foliation of a complex torus, linear holomorphic foliation of a complex torus, I will compactify the foliation. So A is a compactification of a complex torus, and this is a compactification of the foliation. And it's a holomorphic foliation, but the compactification is non kähler It's a non kähler manifold. Uh, it compactifies the Kronecker group, and uh, quantum CP1 is the space of leaves of this foliation. I can define it by charts, but I can also construct, integrate a holomorphic foliation on a complex manifold so that the quantum toric is the space of leaves of this foliation. And now you are working on holomorphic foliations. Uh, in fact, NH is a hop surface for P1. <laughs> for quantum P1, NH bar is independent of H bar, a hop surface. What changes with H bar is I have a family of foliations on the hop surface that as I vary the parameter, I vary of these holomorphic foliations on the hop surface, and the space of leaves is P1. Uh, the, the case of P1 is when it's rational, when the leaves close on elliptic curves. But as I move this, it's quantum P1, and then all the orbifolds, all the weighted practice spaces, and then all the non commutative P1s. As I move the, the holomorphically the parameter on the foliage. Uh, so this is what's going on. This is what's going on. I have all these foliations, and, and I have, of course, a big foliation. Uh, I have the modular space of quantum P1s, and above them, I have this big foliation. Uh, uh, on a on a part of a, on a hop surface. Well, uh, yeah, uh, has to do with Tate Shafarovich group. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll try to get into that later. Uh, in any case, uh, classical torques uh, can be. I, can, should, I just talked about P1, but classical torques have to appear this way, and they will appear this way. This was Laurent and Alberto. Uh, gave an answer for, to uh, for toric varieties as rational foliations on generalized Calabi Eggman manifolds called as. Uh, Lopez Medrano, Berkowski, Merseman manifolds, LDM manifolds. So we have these LDM manifolds, and there is one for every toric variety, but, and then there are all of them, and they have a very particular foliation that makes the toric variety. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the classical picture, non, the non quantum picture. The non quantum picture. So, uh, as an example, well, the Calabi Eggman manifolds are products of spheres. They can also be thought as intersection of real quadrics. Uh, in any case, for, PA, for products of projective spaces, you get the classical Calabi Eggman manifolds, and you get these elliptic vibrations uh, on, cla of, on classical on products of projective spaces. Uh, the elliptic vibrations on classical projective spaces produce uh, calabi Eggman manifolds. Uh, and, uh, and this generalizes that picture. In any case, uh, we have uh, now, but I will have to talk about how to move the non-commutative degree, how to add the non-commutative degrees of freedom to the commutative case. Because the problem is, think about it, think about it just the non-commutative terms. You have this irrational foliation. Ah, it has all this freedom. I can move the irrational for this. But as soon as I hit a rational point, then it becomes torus not, and I enrich it, and I cannot move. So what I have to do is to make sure that when I hit a rational point, it's not a torus not. It's a real line winding like a torus not. I have to make sure. So I have to add a set stabilizer everywhere. So I have to add a germ. So to make a modular space, I have to add to every toric variety a germ. 
I have to turn on the V field. I have to turn on the V field. I have to turn on the electromagnetic duality. The duality is broken in, in classical algebraic geometry. I have to turn on the electromagnetic duality to go into non commutative algebraic geometry, uh, all minimal algebraic geometry. So I have to turn on the electric magnetic duality. Uh, so that's what I do. Uh, I turn on the. But the beautiful thing is that the third variety knows its magnetic field. So uh, it always knew it. It's the, ba the boundary devices tell you how to conserve the gel. It, it exactly tells you how to conserve the gel. It's canonical for the third variety. So a third variety carries canonically. Uh, a gel, and I just put the canonical gel on every third variety. In fact, there is an equivalence of categories between the third varieties with the gel and the third varieties without the gel. So I lost or gained nothing, but it's just more natural to have the gel. So uh, the case of rational requires more care. <laughs> Ironically, it's the rational case that requires more care. But here the leaves of the foliation wind up on themselves rather than being copies of C. They become elliptic curves. This becomes an elliptic vibration. But elliptic vibration, I don't, I want to turn on a gel on the, a canonical gel on the elliptic vibration. And then the homotopical dimension of P1 and the naive complex dimension coincide and are both equal to one. Uh, and then this is well exactly what we were seeing in Bernardo's talk. We have a bed Z, a ZP, Z. The zero non commutative this is non commutative commutative P P1. And this is P1. But these two are the categories of these two things are the same category. So it's the same to have this guy as to have this guy, because the cycle is completely canonical. It's a two-fold homotopy cover. So that is to say, see, the one that I that I want to put in the modular space is a gel over the classical one, Dan Z. Uh, we refer to this process as calibrating P1, but calibration is canonical. Uh, to obtain CP10. The choice of calibration is by no means unique, but there is a preferred one. The standard calibration. In any case, it's easy to recover P1 from CP10 and vice versa. Uh, uh, doing the, just the two-fold, just, just the search of three varieties allows you to compute the two-fold homotopical. And that's the job you need. Okay, so let's take a simple quantum fan. And people who commit the geometry, even in sister algebras, have known this phenomena, although they do it in this uh, very elaborate cocycle fashion. Rather than in a topological fashion, they do it in this very elaborate cocycle fashion in, with the algebras. But they cannot not do it. They have to do it because it's the only way to do it. Uh, so, in any case, uh, the goal that all the information to reconstruct CP1 can be combinatorially encoded in these two cones, they go like this, together with the integral lattice. Likewise, now I will define H bar is a quantum fan consisting of the cones. This is a quantum fan, except that the lattice is not Z, it's gamma. Well, gamma could be generated by one and the square root of two, for example by h bar by the Planck's constant is generally one and the Planck's constant in the algebra of the Weyl algebra that appear in quantum mechanics so uh, so now i should tell you because you want to know these stacks are stacks where where do they live and they live in the toric site so uh, so uh, Affine toric varieties are uh, reversible. Affine varieties contain a complex source. As I said, it's key open subset such that the action of TD on itself extends to an action of TD on T, given by the algebraic morphism. So far, so good. A toric morphism between toric varieties and morphism of varieties that is equivalent with respect to the corresponding torus actions. We we'll say that a Sarisky open subset of T is toric if it's itself a toric sub variety of T. It's okay. And we could even define some motivic rings and things like that. Uh, we take as a base category for the stacks, this thing, fine toric varieties and toric morphism. And we take for covering of an of high toric variety at the composition into toric that is open subsets of T. 
when we discover it, we have a sign, the dotted sign. So this is the sign. But we will be making our stack leave. This stack leave there naturally. Uh, so far, I have been making them live on many forces. Of course, on many forces they will live, but they are they live on this much more structure side. I will also need the equivalent analytic side, of course, because of, it's the subject of all this stuff. You know, group actions, singularities. Uh, so, uh, so we, I need the category of complex analytic spaces. Uh, Compact ng endowed with a holomorphic action of a complex abelian Lie group with a Sariski op. So it's like convex, but now it's uh, not. I never said compact. I never said compact. So uh, I allow, you know, like circle, the terms not well compact, but not the other leaves. I allow some things to not be compact, to be portions not to be compact, or everything. Uh, so morphism equivalent holomorphic mappings that restrict to Lie group homomorphisms. Uh, and observe that there is a naturally fully faithful functor from here to here, of course. From T to G. And by a cover of an object here, we meet and we mean an object here, you know, in G. We have this and we have this fully faithful functor. And now we have free and proper holomorphic action of a discrete abelian group discrete abelian group whose quotient is t together with a quotient map which is an unramified analytic equivalent cover of t natural thing a natural thing to do so we have this equivalent analytic side we have the toric side that is inside the equivalent analytic side it's analytic but outline a little bit it doesn't need to be analytic it can live in all minimal geometry I just need the exponential function. I can live in all minimal geometry. Okay, so I should have said, and the lectures of Alfonso Ruiz will be about C minimality and O minimality. I, I could have said the O minimal, the equivalent O minimal site. I didn't need to say analytic. In any case, quantum toric stacks are of the form this discrete group X x in the analytic equivalent side, h discrete abelian, or a complex abelian group, uh, or the same data or, of such. To be more precise, we consider the categories whose subjects are t, t, m, t in g, t in t, m here, are covers of a space t with an equivalent holomorphic map m. Just like what you do with BG, you know, you have a uh, equivalent holomorphic map A. You have this X, of this equivalent holomorphic map from the G side, and you have this toric object. And here it's assumed to be equivalent with respect to both the H action and the G action. And morphisms are what you would expect them to be. So quantum toric stacks are stacks of that form. <laughs> Quantum toric stacks are stacks of that form. I will be one. You see that it can be done. Uh, so, uh, uh, here uh, we should say uh, d equals one. We should say equals one. And define gamma as a subgroup of R generated by one and square root of two. Classical quantum torus. Uh, because square root of two is irrational if it's dense in R. And it acts freely on R by translation, but this action is not proper, and the topological quotient is not Hauser. Uh, and they are not separated, not, not separated like that. Uh, uh, so, well, uh, not a manifold, and we need to, and we want it to be, have a complex structure. Uh, so, the quantum torus has to be understood as a category fiber in group points over the toric side. <coughs> Objects are gamma covers, gamma is a quantum lattice T over space A, and <coughs> equivalent homogeneous map to C. Very simple. So, but I'm very precise, it is what it is. Okay, uh, and again, in this example, 
we have this linear map. We have this linear map. So we, this is that, think about it. What we are creating is a, is a formal language. You can think of the language on this stack, on this topos. We are creating a formal language where these symbols make sense. By the construction of this stack, the language of the topos allows naturally these expressions. The language of these topos. But in a geometric fashion, it's about covers and logarithms. So uh, we have, well, this one goes to right square to two, two to two, preserves gamma. So is the sense to the torus. This is the quantum torus, this is quantum torus, and this is a morphism of the quantum torus. So I compactify, I compactify, and I take this automorphism of the quantum torus to glue. But the gluing in the language of the topos is W to the square root of two, which makes perfect sense. It sense in the cover. And it's totally constructible. It's an all minimal, totally all minimal structure, uh, constructible object. So this is the this is the uh, this is the quantum torus as a stack over this side. Uh, so uh, classical P one can also be obtained like this. This is just classical P one, but of course remember P one carries is zero. Uh, so. Uh, I do two copies of the fine toric variety Z along the Sarisky open set Z star via this map as a stack on P. It may be presented as following the same data of a fine toric variety. And now that it's very obvious but beautiful that the exact information for the descent data in this, lang in this language I created is the information of the fan. Perfectly natural. The information of the fan, but the fan lives in the language of these topos. And the information of the fan is exactly what gives you the descent data to get the, the stack over the, over the side. So uh, an object T is a pair such that T is a covering, and we have M1, M2, C star. And then, well, here, like this, I obtain the exactly the same data to obtain this as a stack over T. Yeah. So maybe I went a little bit too fast about this, but uh, just to convey the flavor of the fact that this is, is a correct language for this story, or one correct language for this story. We also have another version, non-standard models of mathematics and whatnot. But in any case, we have this, uh, this correct language for this. Uh, well, amorphism, uh, between these and these, I'm satisfy this. Uh, and it was just this, so to the stack P1, it's just a, a, in this case, a very complicated way of saying what is P1. Uh, but the point here is that once given the category of fine tonic varieties, general tonic varieties can be defined directly and formed totally through this the same data procedure. In the quantum case, we'll first define a fine simplicial quantum tonic varieties as discrete quotient stacks. And then general simplicial quantum torus varieties through the same, obviously. Uh, so uh, a general quantum toric stack can be constructed starting from a general, not necessarily rational. Now this is very nice. In the past, uh, we we had this rush, this diophantic condition for the fun. In general, the quantum torus has the rational irrational dichotomy. Now we will have the rational irrational dichotomy. If everything is rational, then we get the classical theory. In the, as soon as the fan is irrational, we get a quantum toric uh, stack that is not a classical toric variety. It's bona fide and non-commutative. It's really a quantum integrable system, really it, it, there is a machine to produce from there an, uh, an operator algebra. That is a quantum integrable system. This operator algebra on, on Hilbert space. So a general quantum toric stack can be constructed starting from a general quantum fan, but not necessarily rational. So you, now you have a fan 
That is not necessary that I should know what is important is that it lands on gamma. So it's important that it lands on gamma. And in the past, I could take only as a primitive generator of the ray, in classical toy geometry. I can have to pick, make a choice. So every ray, a quantum fan is something with a choice uh, at every ray. Uh, and because the gamma could have more generators, there is these marked points at the rate, and then more marked points indicating the additional generators. So this is a quantum fan, this classical fan, or a stacky fan. Uh, even a stacky fan is the rational version of this. Uh, but a classical fan certainly is a rational version of this. And our friend uh, Lev has defined these stacky fans with his collaborators, and these are a particular case of this in, of this story. But then before we really want to consider the calibrated case, adding uh, the B field, uh, turning on the electromagnetic duality, at the level of fans is achieved by the definition of a calibrated quantum fan. So let me tell you what is a calibrated quantum fan. This is, this turns on the electromagnetic duality. Not only having this, but remembering H. So the Planck's constant becomes many Planck's constants in higher dimension, not one. Of course, I could make them numerically the same uh, and have one, but I have the freedom to have several Planck constants in this quantum integrable system. And I, I have this map from Zn, n bigger than d typically, and I have H, and this is Planck's morphism, <laughs> our calibration. So this turns on the electromagnetic duality. And this is the really nice objects to produce the modular space. The, now the big coordinate on the modular space will be H. And there will be an arithmetic, an arithmetic group acting on the story, of course. So a calibrated quantum fan, uh, well, and then we will get a toric variety associated to a calibrated quantum fan, and the notation is getting a little bit heavy. But it's just, uh, uh, you see, one, you the gamma lattice, let's go by parts, you know, layers. RD, good. Gamma quantum lattice. Your gamma really defines a quantum torus, because this is the holonomy of the. But, but I want the rational, the rational case not to be different. So H defines a quantum torus, and now it's a quantum torus in the rational case together with a gerb. So now it's bona fide, modular space of quantum torus, all right? And now I put the fan, and this tells me how to compactify this quantum torus into a quantum toric variety. So this is a, and this is the correct object. This is a correct geometric combinatorial object, a calibrated quantum fan, Essentially, a quantum fan plus a calibration and the homomorphism z to the n to gamma determine the various Planck lengths of the quantum system. Uh, you have the various Planck lengths of the quantum systems at, at different, uh, you could even have quantum system at different scales, which is not unheard of. Uh, in any case, calibrated is uncalibrated plus a gerb. Uh, if you want to think about it like this, the relation between the calibrated quantum toric stack and the uncalibrated version uh, is uh, a gerb. The calibrated is a gerb over the uncalibrated. And the band is z to the a, where a is n minus the rank of gamma. Uh, so uh, we have the, uh, and what is a? A is this excess of points, you know, this is excess of points that are not on the race. Uh, so you have uh, the calibrated quantum torques is a gerb over with band z to the a. In particular, if a equals to zero, well, there's nothing because, yeah. So this is a calibration issue, and it's a very important issue, otherwise I don't get modular spaces. Uh, uh, the pro quantum predictive line, uh, well, is more or less like the one we were doing with the square root of uh, two, uh, and this, well, let me try to uh, not say very much about this. This is more or less the same situation there. Uh, uh, but here, uh, I, I insist that when 
is rational. Uh, we get uh, the weighted to the footballs and the teardrops drops and all this story. Uh, so the other folks are there. Uh, the stacky toric varieties are there. And then the non commutative ones enrich the whole situation into a modular space. Uh, so, uh, the gamma complete and complete standard quantum fan of R2, it has three rays. This is what would be P2. And now I move the ray, the, 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 this ray that goes like this. This is P2, and I move the ray. Uh, uh, and I get the gamma complete quantum deformation of P2. All the, for example, in, in the paper of uh, Lurmil and Denis, and uh, maybe Tony, I forget the exact authors, they have these deformations of PN into quantum non commutative PN, and they are only a little portion of the whole deformations that can be achieved for PN. They're just the, the ones that are very algebraically easy to write down, but there is many more. And, uh, and this is a complete module space. Uh, here is P2. Uh, and here we have the, the quantum torus. This, this three quantum torus, the same quantum torus, but presented differently. And this allows you to glue. And remember, A and B could be rational. Now, this, in the language of the topos, these expressions make sense. And you have these gluings, and you get the full deformation space for P2. You get a, a bunch of quantum P2s. And this is by charts. This is by charts. I don't know how much time. I will, I will I have another lecture. Uh, this is a really impressionistic. It amounts to linear algebra calculations in the end to compute part of this structure. Uh, well, uh, the category of simplicial calibrated quantum toric varieties equivalent to the category of quantum toric fans. You can prove, we can prove the thing, of course. This is to be expected. And uh, we have quantum geometric invariant theory, but not today. Next time, I will, I will start with quantum geometric invariancy, and that will explain a little bit better the structure of the modular space. But I'll go into the compactification of the modular space, how to conserve the compactification of the modular space, and some more information about it. So, so far, uh, so good. <laughs>